the right strategies. And Lori. Okay, thank you, Terrence, um, and thanks to everyone on the call for joining us today. Um, I, we're going to be talking about corporate partnerships, and Tracy and myself are excited to take you through this in the next hour. Um, I'm going to start off, and Tracy's going to pick up a little bit later. Um, so, let's see. A uh, quick agenda, we'll do a quick introduction of ourselves um, and then some uh, overview of the corporate giving landscape to set the context for all of this and review types of corporate partnerships and then jump into the actual steps in the fundraising cycle for corporate partnerships. And we will uh, do our best to leave some good time at the end for questions. So um, if you've got some along the way, you know, feel free to put them in the question box so that you don't forget about them um, and we will uh, uh, read them off at the end and answer some of those. Uh, so, quick introduction of Thread Strategies. We are a, a nonprofit fundraising consulting firm um, that specifically works with small to medium sized nonprofits building development departments so they can efficiently and effectively raise funds needed to advance their missions. Um, we seek to help solve the turnover problem of a lot of um, that small nonprofits face a lot of a kind of rotating door of development professionals, development staff members by creating more stable processes and strategies for fundraising in general so that it becomes a, uh, you know, a more attractive place for a talented fundraiser to work and then together move these important missions forward. And uh, this is an overview of the workshop, but Terrence already wrote that. So uh, I'm sorry, read that to you. So we'll get right to it. So first, a uh, quick overview of the corporate giving landscape to set the tone for everything that we're talking about today. A quick poll, so use your question box to uh, chat in some thoughts on this. What do you think is the percent of annual giving in the United States that comes from corporations each year? Um, throw out some percents of funding annually, you think. So I see 10, I see 30, uh, 16, 35, 25. All right, some good thoughts here. 40, thank you guys so much for your participation. So you can see it's a little bit, um, you know, we've, we've got a lot of different thoughts on just how much money is coming from corporations every year. Um, I am happy to reveal the answer is actually 5%. Um, this, this, uh, Infographic here is from Giving USA. This is 2018's report, which is a report on the philanthropy for a year 2017. I actually think that um, next week is when the new Giving USA is released. Uh, it's definitely in June, and I, I believe it's coming next week. And so that will be 2019's report, which will be numbers on 2018. But I can share that in in recent years, in the last five years at least, corporate Giving by corporations has remained fairly steady at around 5%. So it is not, uh, you know, it, it may fluctuate a little bit this year, but we're not, we wouldn't be seeing this jump to double digits by any means. Uh, so I want to make the point from the beginning that it's the smallest piece of the pie in funding. Um, and, uh, you know, so don't want to discourage you off the bat, but just want to put into context about what the real opportunity is that we're talking about when it comes to pursuing corporate funding. And, you know, often it's the flashier fundraising um, that gets a lot of attention because there's a lot of press releases around corporate money. And, you know, we, we hear a lot about what corporations are doing in the community, which is, which is amazing. But, you know, just to be clear about how much the big the, the piece of the pie is to be had all around, it's smaller than foundations and individuals. So as you're uh, looking to employ some of the strategies that you learned today, um, you know, keep, keep a balance with other funding sources as well. Um, and to kind of balance out that, you know, news that might have sounded a little dismal. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to corporate partnerships. So, you know, I, I want to then make sure that we're talking about why it is worth thinking through and potentially um, engaging in a strategy for corporate fundraising. Uh, there's certainly potential for high dollar amounts. Um, they are easily researched. You know, most companies at this point have their CSR platforms on their websites. Um, like I said, a lot of press releases, you know, it's usually 
pretty easy to find what a company is dedicating its time and money to it, as far as a community and philanthropic involvement. So you can easily see whether you may or may not be a fit to not be wasting your time with, with um, opportunities that you're not a fit for. Um, you, there's chances to connect your work to their customers and network. So beyond, beyond just dollars raised, uh, there's a chance to potentially engage a, a wider community through a corporate partnership, which would then boost your exposure and brand um, and potentially help lift your brand through uh, association with certain qualities of you know particular companies and legitimize it in the eyes of your supporters, um, hopefully leading to acquiring new supporters that are not just the company and the company dollars, but um, uh, some of their customers and um, the folks that they're touching through their work. And then of course, you know, all of this is about a two-way relationship, about a partnership. There's a reason that we call this corporate partnerships and not just corporate sponsorships or corporate funding. It's because, you know, when this is done, the, this, when this is done best, it's a true partnership where there's a two-way relationship and that there's um, opportunities to be gained by, by you as the organization um, as well as the company and that you can truly build a relationship together. Oops, I went too far. So we wanted to start by also going over different types of partnerships that you might engage a corporate, um, a corporate funder in just so that there's kind of some common terminology that we might be used. So there's event-related partnerships, which may be what you're most familiar with. Um, these are, you know, sponsorships of galas or walks or, you know, any other fundraising event that you may go to. It's very likely you see company names, you know, on banners and, and buying tables and whatnot. You know, that's one type. Uh, there's also... Um, just straight corporate funding dollars that are unrestricted and you know come to your annual funding. That is, of course, what we all strive for and uh, would be the kind of the ultimate win. Um, there's cause marketing, so that would be you know what you see a lot of with Komen, uh, uh, Susan G. Komen, and, and the pink ribbons that you you know buy this and a certain percent of um, your purchase goes to the cause. There's skills-based volunteering. A lot of professional firms especially do this. A lot of um, uh, accounting firms and consulting firms where they do pro bono work um, with, with their employees using the skills. Uh, there's employee giving um, and matching uh, matching gifts I would actually put in here that you know if you can engage employees in giving and then potentially have the employer match it. There's a matching campaign. So you might have a sponsor, a company, a corporate partner that puts up a certain amount of dollars that then you would use to leverage to match with other fundraising that you're doing for um, from your own constituents. And then of course, in-kind partnerships where they're donating product um, to, you know, if you have a big walk and you get your water donated, um, you know, that's certainly a value add to you, even though it might not be dollars. So, you know, keep all of those in mind and, uh, you know, when you're thinking about what might make most sense for your organization, um, you know, think first about what kind of opportunities you have to offer that could, that could work within these different partnership types. So the next thing we wanted to cover is um, the fundraising cycle. This isn't anything new to those of you who are seasoned fundraisers on the line, but as we, um, as we're talking through corporate partnership techniques within the next steps of the cycle, we wanted to just take a quick minute to review the cycle itself through a corporate partnership lens and make sure that we're all working off the same terminology. So just as we think of individual donors moving through these steps, so do corporate partners. You'll need to prospect companies with alignment to your work and then build a relationship with them before asking for money and then to make an actual ask and uh, you know, potentially a proposal, um, it might be a formal pitch, you know, there's different ways that that might happen, but you do need to make the ask. And then of course, it's super important to be stewarding the relationships after they become funders. So keeping these steps in mind, let's dig into each of the steps and start with prospecting. 
So you want to find companies with alignment and then draw on your commonalities to build relationships. So you're looking for aligned values, culture and brand, and just um, commonalities between what your work is and what the company does and what the company has said that they care about. Oftentimes, corporate partners express these elements about themselves on their websites, especially those with really well-defined CSR programs. So it can be really easy to find um, often, which is helpful. You know, it's harder to tell that about an individual donor sometimes. Um, but it's, it's hard to know how to identify with what matches for you and, and to find alignment until you take the time to articulate your own core values and culture and brand. So to do this, you want to think about what makes you unique as an organization and start to actually write it down. And then when you find alignment with your own core components, you can articulate how this might set you apart from your peers when you're talking to a potential company. Um, and you'll be ready to uh, share this with your prospects in your initial outreach. You know, and then showing them from the start that you have things in common that make it worth engaging in, conver in conversations and getting to know each other. And that this is not just um, kind of a spray and pray where you sent, you know, template emails out to 50 different companies because you saw their name on a billboard, but instead that you've done your research and that you're, you're articulating to them from the beginning that there is something that you have in common and that a partnership would make sense. So other areas of alignment that make for a successful and attractive partnerships are an overlapping audience or population. You know, this is an asset that you possess that would make a partnership with you an attractive proposition for a company. Um, and so therefore, it's, it's helpful if you know your target demographic so that you can, um, you can share this. You know, what is the size of your reach and uh, in, via social media and direct mail? What is the participation in your programs? What is the social demographic of your audience? Um, some examples of this would be, you know, for Amer example, American Kidney Fund helps dialysis patients. And so naturally, um, dialysis companies would be a good corporate partner for them um, or other patient related vendors and pharmaceuticals because they share the same community that they are both trying to talk to the same the same general population and there's value for those dialysis companies in partnering with the American Kidney Fund and um, in, and therefore that's an asset that the organization has to share to leverage the you know of the dollars of a partnership. Um, or another example would be um, a smaller nonprofit that we've worked with um, called Love Football focuses on Latin America in their work or had traditionally focused on Latin America building um, football soccer fields in Latin America. And so they partnered with ESPN um, to do some projects because ESPN was expanding their reach to Latin America. So in that case, again, the organization natural population of who they serve and who they reach was um, an asset to a corporation that was looking to get in front of that same audience. So uh, when, when you take the time to think about who your audience is and the size of it and the demographics, um, that is a, a huge value that you have to pitch to a potential corporate partner. And will also help you hone in on which corporations even make most, most sense to be approaching for a partnership. So once you take the time to know yourself, it'll really help you uh, hone your research for prospecting what organizations that you um, want to reach out to and target. So not only do you want to find a strong fit along these lines, is it's more likely that you'll get a positive response to your solicitation, but it's also your own best interest to be aligning yourself with brands that reflect who you are and safeguard to your own reputation as well. So yes, the main reason to prospect is so that you can get a yes in the end, but also think about you know, who you want to be associated with and what they do. Then methods for how and where to find companies once you've your research parameters in place. Um, looking at companies that are headquartered in your geographic over region or overlapping um, areas, geographic that you both serve. Um, keeping up with business news to see what brands are investing in and what they're getting involved in. Using LinkedIn to look for connections that you might have or also um, 
looking using some of the advanced search functions to look at the industry uh, and then once you've got your list of companies to approach you want to identify the decision maker to approach first so if that can be a warm introduction that's always preferable so circulate your prospect list among all of your staff your board your key stakeholders even if someone knows someone at the company who works there but is not the decision maker, the employee may be able to help get you to the decision maker with an introduction that's coming from within rather than sending out just cold outreach um, where you're trying to introduce yourself cold to the company. That's definitely possible, and I've you know in the past had luck with it, but I can tell you that that takes a lot longer um, to get a response and any interest than if you have a warm outreach or sorry, a warm introduction of any type. So then you can. Um, craft your pitch so it focuses on the alignment and overlap that you spent all that time defining in the previous step that we talked about um, so that when you do get to the right person you are um, immediately ready to show them the value that you might be able to bring to them in a partnership because you've researched um, your overlapping um, elements and you can point out to them to the, at the beginning that you are approaching them with thought and um, and not just asking everybody that you know for the same thing. So once you've identified your, um, once you've identified you know, who you want to approach, then the next step is to cultivate them. Um, as we all know, it doesn't make, uh, you don't want to just start asking for money before you've built a relationship. Um, so the first step in cultivating is to plan your approach. Um, an initial ask of a 15 minute phone conversation to learn more um, is a great way, a low lift of the person that you're asking at the company to give you some time. Um, if you put yourself in their shoes for a minute, think about the fact that these people are usually getting asked for their time over and over and over again. Because, and then getting asked for money, and sometimes just getting asked for money before the conversation to, to build a relationship. So if you make a quick point that you already did your research to prove overlap in the work, in their work and yours, and then position your first ask as a chance to learn more about their work to understand how it might fit with yours, this is a better way to get their attention than launching right into a really long pitch about your organization um, and potentially not customizing that to be specific to how you overlap. Um, so you want them to know from your very first outreach that you're standing out from the crowd, that you are different, you, you're you doing the work for them to show them that you align with what they care about, you're asking them for a short amount of time, and you wanna learn more about their work. You know, People enjoy sharing with you things that they are proud of more than they necessarily enjoy talking to a stranger that they haven't ever had any contact with and might not, you know, it otherwise don't have time. So. You do want to know in your head what you hope to come out of the initial conversation. Um, you know, are there questions that you have specifically about their work? Um, you definitely want to understand their timeline and their budget cycle and leave the conversation. If you are able to get it, a conversation, you want to leave with a deeper understanding of how their work overlaps in the area of your work. I mean, that is your ultimate goal is that you want to be able to use this conversation to put together a very tailored and targeted pitch later. You don't want to just launch into asking them for money in a generic way. And so, you know, ask them, ask them whatever questions you need, let them talk about their work, let them be proud of their work, um, and resist the urge to just shove your work down their, their throat from the beginning, you know, flip the switch on that. Um, and then you, you want to leave them with something to review after your conversation to to follow up with and keep in mind. So something short and sweet like an infographic or a one pager, um, you know, have that at the ready so that you can follow up afterward um, with kind of next steps showing them that there's something more to be to be talked about and, and more of a relationship to build. Um, and if there's an opportunity to experience your program firsthand as a next step, that's also a really great next step after the initial conversation. Um, you know, not everybody can have it, depending on your program, there might not be an opportunity to visit in person and, and see it operating in person, but certainly if that is something that you can do, you know, following up that conversation 
by inviting uh, someone out to experience it and see it firsthand is a, is a good step, um, next step. But point being that you want to continue to build a relationship, continue dating, if you will, before you propose any marriage um, or a you know significant ask of them. You want to build a relationship. So here's another spot where we'd love for you all to give us a little bit of input. Um, you know, webinars can be hard. You're just listening and we're just, you know, talking. So in the question box, um, we'd love for you to share some thoughts on what goals a corp any corporation might have and, and how a nonprofit might be able to help achieve those goals. Um, any thoughts on what some of that overlap might be that you're looking for in your research and that you might um, share on your uh, in your first conversation. So I see marketing, employee engagement, amplifying the message. Thank you all for sh for those community impact, um, responsibility. Excellent. Exposure to a new audience, helping them sell a product. These are great. All of these are true. All of these are things that definitely nonprofits can help to uh, goals that corporations have that nonprofits can help advance. Increase employee engagement, culture affirmation, board membership. That's a really very thoughtful one. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for for sharing and for the thoughts. And so here's some that we had thought of, and this is not an exhaustive list. So some of these are things you all chatted in. Some of the things you chatted in um, are in addition to what we'll share. So certainly, um, I'm not sure if everyone can see the questions box, but we'll make sure we can compile these and send them out with the slides at the end as well, because these are some really great thoughts that you all have shared with each other, which is often the benefit of these trainings is learning not just from um, you know us, but learning from each other. So some potential shared goals that we have uh, a halo effect, so an improved brand perception. That's the halo effect is the terminology in the cause marketing space of when um, the brand, the company's brand, gets a better reputation from being associated with a, a strong cause. Um, exposure to a new market. Um, this is what I kind of was mentioning earlier about. Uh, if you know if a company like ESPN moving into Latin America as an example, if you know a company is looking to break into a new market and that market happens to be who you serve, that can be a huge value to them. Uh, they might want to win customers from a competing brand by using that halo effect or or moving into a new market. All of those things, employee satisfaction is a is a really big one. Um, there's a lot of research, especially as millennials are moving into the workplace, about the expectations of employees on their employers to provide meaningful engagement opportunities and give back. Um, there's a lot of research around an increased consumer willingness to pay for products. So um, brands that are that are perceived to be doing good uh, in the community, uh, consumers are willing to pay more for that. Uh, aligning with workforce needs. So this would be um, building the next generation of talent to hire, especially a lot of tech companies are investing in tech nonprofits because you know they're they're seeing their own future here. That if they want to keep growing, they need to know that there's a talent pipeline for the work that they do, and um, nonprofits that are building that next workforce uh, directly can benefit the company down the line. So basically, you want to talk. You want to think about what's the specific ROI of what that company might be interested in and what you might be able to help them accomplish with their business goals through what you naturally do with your work. And I want to be careful to say, you know, we're never advocating that you should look at what a company does and then change how you do what you do to fit it. It's more looking for the overlaps, looking for the prospects back in that research stage that naturally align with the things that you do. Um, and then beginning to make that case to them through, through building the relationship. So just a little statistic here, back to that point of consumer willingness to pay, um, that 91% of customers switch to brands that support good causes. The reason we share this statistic is to say that the overlap with the same community or customer is a strong reason for our company to get involved with a nonprofit. And they're seeing these studies that show that their customers 
um, respond to companies that prove themselves to be good citizens and and they're taking this in and making decisions based on it. So this, this really works out well when there is alignment between their customers, what their customers care about and what you do. And that's why the cultivation steps that we went over are so important. So before you make a formal ask, you want to know as much as you can about them and what their goals are, what their audience is, and where you overlap in that so that you can highlight it as part of your pitch and make a stronger pitch to show what the value is. So I'm going to pass now to my partner, Tracy, who's been sitting here and listening to me and um, let her talk about that next step of making the pitch. All right. Um, and thanks you guys for chiming in and being a part of the conversation today. I definitely want to make sure that uh, at this point I point out that, you know, we spent the first 25 to 28 minutes talking about those first steps because, as Lori said, they are so critical in forming successful corporate partnerships. And we like to refer to them as partnerships because that's what it is. Um, but it's very important to remember as you continue to develop these relationships that you are presenting a business opportunity for these companies. It, and it helps them increase and achieve their goals in certain ways, uh, but this is, they are, they are businesses and they have uh, their own strategic and financial goals as business and you as a partner of theirs should strive to help them meet those goals. And so as you think about when you're going to go in to pitch a, a partnership, that you would look at your materials and your communication, who's, who's making the pitch, what materials you're designing, what they look like, do they communicate that brand alignment uh, that you have been striving so hard to uh, to communicate to them as as uh, you would want them to bring you on as a good partner of theirs. So again, those those sh shared goals that you've been talking about within this whole the, the first two steps of the process. Make sure that as you go into pitch that you are thinking about those conversations. So when you show up, it's a consistent message as well as a consistent look to the things that you've been speaking with them about. So let's talk a little bit then about the actual pitch. You've done the work and now you are, you've, you've gotten the time in front of the decision maker. You've had some conversations. You feel confident about what you're going to share and uh, what you're going to ask. And again, you are, you're going to them and bringing to them in your pitch what you bring to the table as a partnership for this company or this uh, group of companies, if, as you will. So it's important to ask yourself uh, that question again and again as you prepare your pitch um, and prepare to speak with those decision makers. What do you have to give and bring to the table? So it's really important to be specific about the tangible elements of your partnership. Um, I think a lot of times uh, there's there, there creeps into our language in the nonprofit industry a little bit of ambiguity about doing good in the world. That is awesome. And we believe that most, if not all of you, are doing good in the world with your organizations and your missions. But it's really important that you finesse and parse the tangible and personalized elements of your partnership in which the organization helps achieve those companies' goals, whether that's their business or their employee um, what are their goals and how are those individual elements of what you do helping them? You want to provide ideas, but not necessarily a menu uh, when you're working with companies. It's really important to talk about based on the goals that you've talked about, hopefully in that, that dating stage, you're getting to know a company, that you come to them with some ideas, but then you also do as much listening perhaps as you do talking. If you've pitched a good, if you're having good conversation, you've asked some really strategic and thoughtful questions that you are listening to what they think like, think the partnership could look like and what are some of their ideas. Um, I think in the past, you know, we've seen a lot of those menus. Well, a five thousand dollars will get you X, Y, Z and so on and so forth. But that we really want you to shift gears into partnership mindset beyond a menu. Um, it's not flexible. Uh, to some of their ideas or their needs as a business. And you might have just as well not spent the time within the partnership developing that relationship. You could have just sent them an email with the menu. Uh, if that's what you, if that's, if you stay rigid, you don't allow room for that relationship to grow and blossom really. So your conversation with them should be planned. Obviously we want you to be prepared. That's very important, but it should also be organic. Um, they certainly know their goals and they wouldn't have taken the meeting unless they see some path forward to some partnership with you as an organization. So that's important 
uh, that speaks highly as you get these this opportunity to speak to them. It speaks highly of the relationship building that you've been doing and of their opinion of the partnership that might uh, in turn come to pass. So your time with them should be a time to discuss. And then as you make that pitch, you should highlight your former successes, maybe with other corporate partners, and definitely include the impact that those partnerships have made for your organization, as well as those other corporate partners. It's important to say, we we know what we're doing, we've done this in the past, and here's the impact that we've had with in this program or XYZ when we partnered here and there. Um, that, that speaks again to your understanding of what they, what they need to hear from you as a corporate, a potential corporate partner. Um, we certainly want you to be, be results driven as you uh, put, put this information forward and be clear that the relationship continue and will and continue to bring value. Again, of course, we would suggest that you be prepared with a formal proposal, a presentation that includes some sort of visual aid and some sort of information that you can hand as you speak uh, with them during the time that you spend together so they can refer to that and take notes. Um, but just come as prepared as possible, but be willing to, to let the conversation flow um, as you ask really good and strategic questions of them. So when you think about those proposals, sometimes uh, it can seem a little daunting. Uh, what do you say? How much do you say? Uh, what, what are the most the key pieces of those proposals? Because you want to strike a very fine balance so that you're not handing them an encyclopedia, but you're, you're providing them the right information so that they can make a decision with all the information that's, in, that's pertinent to the potential partnership. So here are the elements that we would say that would be the basic elements of your pitch or proposal that you are um, handing to them. This, these elements help you highlight the full, full circle, circle of your partnership as you begin to partnership, begin a partnership with them. You talk about what value your organization brings to the table in your value proposition, um, what makes you what makes your organization an attractive investment, what their return would be, how do you create ongoing value? Those are all elements of a really good value proposition and how it will help boost the company's goals. Um, then you think about what you can do in the marketing world, how you boost their visibility, not just um, maybe in, internally. Yes, there's probably a lot that you can do for corporate um, and employee well-being as you partner with organizations, but how are you going to help them boost their visibility in the community, either the community that they are in geographically or the community that overlaps with your goals and uh, your constituency? Um, there might be some co-branded examples when it comes to those marketing initiatives. Um, the, other, the other last two pieces are really important. How are you going to measure when your partnership is successful? List out the key metrics that you're going to talk with them. Talk about how you're going to track those. Give an example of how you've tracked them in the past and what that maybe quarterly or biannual uh, report will look like as you help share with them the success that you're having as uh, partners. And then again, highlight what is beneficial on both sides of the table. And then of course, there will be an ask. And we would suggest that you be confident in that, in that ask. Will you? Will you partner with us? Will you join us in this effort? Uh, and, and that's really important because you're confident in the good that you do uh, for your constituency. Um, but confidence as well as clarity is really important as you make your pitch. What are you asking for um, in whether that's in dollar amount or in other types of shared benefits? And then what are the immediate next steps for moving forward so that you can keep the conversation uh, moving, moving from this step of we're making the ask to next step of we've closed the deal. So we know that that's often the hardest part of the conversation, but it is absolutely critical that you don't spend this all this time developing and pitching, and then you fail to, to actually invite them to be involved and be a partner. That's really, really important. So once you've made this ask, make sure that you are open to uh, either alternatives or options as their ideas come to the table as you've made your ask, and they would suggest maybe either um, thinking about it in a different way or um, navigating to the end result in perhaps a different a few different steps. Either way, once you make the ask, it opens the door for conversations about that, but you've been confident in what you would like your partnership to look like uh, with them. So of course, as you are in front of people, sometimes it can be difficult, especially when a lot could be riding on a partnership, especially if it's a large company and the partnership can help you maybe launch a new program or, re or reach so many more. Um, in her best-selling book, Presence, uh, bringing your boldest self to your biggest challenges, 
Associate Professor Amy Cuddy from the Harvard Business School when writing about whether or not entrepreneurs receive the backing from venture capitalists, she wrote, the strongest predictors of who got the money were confidence, comfort level, and passionate enthusiasm. And we believe that that goes to, that goes to, that's the same as it is for nonprofits, it is for those who are seeking investment from venture capitalists. Uh, and I, in working with so many wonderful partners and knowing people in the nonprofit in industry, that confidence and passionate enthusiasm um, shows through. I think a lot of times in these types of meetings, the comfort level is where I feel like a lot of times folks need, a, need that extra practice or they need some more uh, preparation to make sure that they are comfort, comfortable having these conversations with uh, those folks in the boardroom or in the C-suite as they are making these pitches. Um, in addition, she describes as what enables you to communicate with passion, confidence, and comfortable enthusiasm while still owning any nerves that you might have is what allows you to express that without arrogance and courage, even in the face of fear and connection without the need to control. So um, those points that she makes um, in, in her book really, I think, illuminate what are those pieces that what you bring to the table in your person um, as you come to pitch those things. So you, where, as you, wherever, however it is that you show up is certainly as important as the materials that you've provided. Um, and those of you who are doing the selling and the talking, it's certainly important that you are communicating that you believe in the proposal's merit as much as you believe in what you do, um, the impact that it's going to make. Uh, we um, Absolutely, so we have a question. Can you say those attributes again? So confidence, comfort level, and passionate enthusiasm. So those are the three that she highlights specifically. Thank you for asking. Sometimes I get it. <laughs> um, absolutely. So all, all that is to say is as you come to the table, as you are, is your best self confidence well you that will open the door to a genuine and sincere relationship with whomever sitting across the table um and it also helps you to find that fine line between confident and aggressive because you want to make sure that you're confident but you don't want to come across as we we need you uh or too pushy so that because that that puts up kind of the defense mechanisms during those meetings um the other piece is it, the other piece that i want to make sure that i communicate is it's really important that you prepare deep subject matter. You don't need to necessarily memorize all the statistics about the impact that you're making, but be prepared for questions. Um, as corporate partners uh, dive in and, and really, really de develop and hope to develop deep partnerships with organizations, they want to know as much about your subject matter as possible because they're also going to be developing material. They're also going to be your champions and your ambassadors once these partnerships move forward. So it's really important that you come prepared with really great subject matter um, or maybe bring a subject matter expert with you to answer those questions as you team tag or tag team this uh, the presentation. In any case, as you come to the table, that passion should show through as far as what you do and the excitement that you feel about this potential partnership and what it could bring to, to the both you and to the, the corporate partner that you're pitching to. So once you've made that great pitch, I know you hopefully you all go and take yourself out for a drink or do some sort of really some celebrating. I think you get to that, you build up to that moment. It feels like such a wash of relief. Uh, we have been in that situation before, um, but it's really critical that you spend time thinking strategically before you make the pitch about how you're gonna follow up. It's really, it's really critical that you know that this is a series of emails that you're going to send. This is the, maybe even the handwritten thank you note or at least the envelope addressed to the right decision makers. Um, are, are they ready for you to take care of that? Because in the release of the stress that making the pitch can bring, sometimes the follow-up and the immediate and appropriate follow-up gets swept to a few days or maybe even a few weeks later. So we don't want that time to lag too much. And of course, you're the person, not the corporation, you're, the organization is the one responsible for really driving the relationship forward. Um, we, we would encourage you to stay in that, in that driver's seat to continue to move, taking steps forward to whatever it's going to be. So we, gratitude is the first, is the first uh, step, really. Express your gratitude in a quick email, uh, a handwritten card, um, maybe even some sort of 
you know, just some sort of little gratitude thing that shows up in their office to let them know that you appreciate their time and their consideration as we, you know, that they're very busy. Um, we want to, you want to make sure that you offer additional resources in your follow-up. And then as you've made that, if you express your gratitude and offered some additional resources, be patient. That's probably the hardest thing to do is to wait, <laughs> especially when you know that the partnership could bring so much to your organization. Um, one particular point of advice there at the end at the end of the list, if you look at that, make sure to confirm all partnerships with a contract reviewed by a lawyer. This is smart and should be beneficial for both your organization so they're not taken advantage of in any way or not set aside or things don't move to completion. It's important as you wait and you hear back from them a yes that you are thoughtful and strategic. That's part of follow-up. That's part of good business practice. Um, that you have thought about how you're going to protect, yes, but also um, solidify that partnership with intention um, that is important for both parties. But again, that follow-up, is it's on you to do, and it's really important that that's in a timely manner, and then you continue to move forward, even though uh, I would call it professionally persistent um, as you get to their answer, hopefully sooner rather than later, but certainly in the instance where you might need to wait a couple of weeks or maybe even a couple of months that you are still there reminding them um, that you're still interested and that you're still very grateful and is there any other information that you can um, follow up with them so continue to follow up for sure so this is a, t a trick or a tip to consider this was given by nonprofit quarterly they recommend sharing with companies that there are on an elite, they are on an elite list of a certain number of businesses that you've approached. This poses a partnership as an exclusive opportunity and shows your enthusiasm for their business specifically. So it puts them in two ways, sets them apart. They're on a list of only a very few number of businesses that you've approached, but also that you've thought about them specifically um, and are enthusiastic about what they do as it relates to what you do as an organization. Um, all right. So the last piece that we're going to talk about, and then we'll uh, get to some more questions and answers if, if, uh, if appropriate, it's certainly important that you have to steward your partnerships. Um, stewardship is after you get the yes uh, and you're moving forward, it's, it's as critical in your long, longevity of these relationships as anything. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a waste of all the research and the stress and the the moving back and forth and figuring out what's the right thing, uh, the work that your team or you have done, if you're not willing to stay in it um, on a on an ongoing regular basis to thank them appropriately, but not just thank, but also inform as you want that partnership to hopefully stick for a while but, and perhaps even grow. There's a few pieces of stewardship that we want to communicate as we uh, think about that that element specifically. Um, stewardship is essentially building the next phase of the relationship that you have with your corporate partners. It's important to be continually thankful and thoughtful um, and taking every chance and opportunity that you can to recognize them appropriately as a partner of yours. Um, specifically in the way in which their, their partnership is bringing meaning and impact to your organization and to those, of, those people um, or areas that you serve. Um, and so that that means you're going to have to talk with them on a regular basis. It can't just be kind of it cannot be autopilot. Corporate partnerships uh, they will end quickly if you set them on autopilot. They have you have to have regular communication with business with the business leaders, the people who've said yes to your idea. But you also need to develop really good and solid relationships with the internal champions within that organization who are helping uh, where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, when with when it comes to your partnership. Um, it's really important that as your partnership is meeting the goals that you have stated early on, um, that you give you give them those statistics and those metrics, and um, helping them parse that out is essentially, for instance, give them the information so that they could share with their employees. For instance, here is an email that you could send, or here's a newsletter article in your next employee newsletter about our work together, and um, externally. Here's a one pager about the impact that you're having in this community that you could send to uh, those people on your mailing list or to the people in that in that region that uh, that your company either your where your headquarters are or where you're expanding to. 
um, you could maybe take out an ad in the paper and, and highlight this partnership and this new area that you're trying to break into. Those are some creative, you can be really creative in the ways that we, which you can express as your, um, as your programs are meeting their goals. Um, it's really also important that you set a time uh, each quarter or twice a year, whatever is right for the timing of the partnership, to sit down and get and garner feedback from those partners. Sometimes uh, we shy away from that feedback because we feel like if it's if it's um, constructive feedback, that it means that they want to end the partnership. And so if we don't talk about it, then maybe we'll just keep going. But feedback helps you hone. Uh, it opens up the door to show that you're respectful, that you listen, and that you're willing to make the changes and that your program is agile enough to meet the needs of their of either their changing business goals or the fact that you've, there are new ways in which you can do what you do better and you want to take them along with you. So don't be afraid of feedback and make sure that you schedule that so they know that you're thoughtful about the way that your program is moving forward. And then finally, use that feedback to uh, and those goals to present growth opportunities for renewal. Hopefully, you can work in multi-year partnerships to begin with, and sometimes that's sometimes that's the case, but it's more rare. Um, but uh, if it's working, and they are that feedback and accomplishing those goals helps helps then pitch your case to hey, we should do this more often, or we should have a three-year partnership or a five-year partnership, or we should be, you know. All, but you have to show that it's working to begin with. And if you don't take those first couple of steps of communicating that feedback, then they don't know otherwise. Um, corporate funders help, get, gaining corporate funders helps you acquire new corporate funders. And so it's important to get, to become really adept at working and, and growing those partnerships so that as uh, the doors open up to new corporate funders, you know those steps. Um, and you're, you're able and adept at bringing new people on board. The other thing that corporate partnerships open up the door for that we, that we all love is those individual donors, whether it be the, their internal staff or the community in which they serve. Um, corporate partnerships can certainly open the door to a whole new base of, of loyal annual givers for your organization. Um, and being able to express the impact that you're having with the company that brought them on board, so to speak, as a donor will help then those donors become loyal annual givers. Um, and so it's important to be thoughtful in the stewardship process. How is that you're communicating those goals, those achievements and the impacts that you're making, the impact that you're making together. Um, and, know, and knowing that uh, and being able to always express that gratitude to that group for the, the impact that you've been able to make together. All right. So we've got some time left for um, questions. We know that there's been some that you all have chatted in already um, and much appreciated. And if there's any more, I'm actually going to pass to Terrence from DonorSearch, who's going to moderate the question section. Um, and, and I'll just say up front that if we don't get to everyone's question, um, obviously they are recorded and, and we are happy to send you a follow-up email with what our response would be. So um, Terrence, I'll let you grab some questions that we can answer in our last 10 minutes. Yes, thank you again, Tracy and Lori. This is a great presentation. Uh, we actually have a question just came in from Joni. She said, do you have any examples of good customized sponsorship packages? Also, do you have any advice on first easy steps when trying to start a program with a small staff or board? So uh, examples of a customized sponsorship package is kind of like a almost like an oxymoron because you know the, the more customized it is then the, the less relevant it is for anyone else but um, we can take a look for something and send that in the follow-up um, but the question about the board well, before we move on I would say specific to customize what I, what I would move towards is a template of how you can share your story of what you do you know we want to make sure that you're thinking partnership based versus menu based so once you have had a conversation, then you might be able to come back with a proposal that highlights in, in some sort of template form good pictures of your programs, the right impact statement. So those are the things I think if I'm if we're gonna if I'm thinking about a good package or things like that, it's it's template based, so you don't have to remake it every time. But it's also opening the doors for you to have those right conversations with your partners um, specifically. That's a good point, yeah. Tracy. Um, and starting with a small staff or board, you know, 
start with connections. Yeah. I mean, earlier I talked about warm introductions being the best introductions. Um, and certainly, if a company is focusing on tech and you and you serve animals, you know, there might not be any overlap there. But whenever there's somebody on the board or on the staff that has a connection to a company and you can also draw a line between what you do and what they care about, that is the best place to start. So you could sit down with the board and staff and do kind of a, a, a life walk and guide them through thinking about who are the people they know, where do they work? And then from where they work, where might there be overlap between what you do and what that company does? And even if someone knows someone who's, you know, mid-level and not a decision maker, like I said, that mid-level person could help introduce you to someone within their company who is a decision maker. And I think it's it might be as easy as, when I worked with a, a board recently, we literally, literally at the board meeting had each of them either open their computers or get on their phone and look at LinkedIn. All of them had a LinkedIn profile and we had done some ideation around the major industries that were missing in their donor profiles. So they have a lot of folks from the, the legal industry and the CPA industry or the accounting industry, but they needed, they were interested in finding people in the education industry specifically. Um, and so we sat down with the board members, we opened up LinkedIn and then that helped train them to look at the connections that they might have related to a specific industry or contacts that, they, that this specific organization wanted to open doors there. So it might be just as easy as literally, I like what Lori said, I like calling it that life walk, where they've been in the past, where they are now, and how, to, how can you draw visually for them and focus their attention, and not just board members, but high level volunteers and those kinds of things, how can you get them into a conversation about those they know, the doors they could open. Sweet, thank you. That's some very insightful information. Now we have a question from Ruben. He says, "What tips do you have for corporate partners that are providing less money than the original donation after the second year of funding?" So it sounds like uh, you're talking about partners that are still with you, but kind of backing off their support instead of growing it, which is what our goal would be. Um, we would, you know, first and foremost, encourage you to to find out why um, and. And it's okay to ask those questions. And again, thinking about a partnership and feedback. And is it if it's their budget has changed? You know, the economy is what it is. But the fact that they've stuck with you speaks volumes to the fact that they are seeing value and alignment. And and showing them that you continue to appreciate that through hard times would mean that they would probably come back when they can at a higher level. But if in that feedback session they share that there is something that no longer closely aligns with their work, but they, they like you, but they're shifting their strategy, you know, it really depends on why they've backed down their support. And so whatever you can do through genuine, authentic conversation to understand why the support level has changed, then you can target your strategy to either um, you know, knowing that if you spend energy on it, it will come back, or hearing that look, this is just not going to be something that's going to cut back to that same level. Not that you should ignore them, but it's not something to pour extra energy into because it is what it is. So the why is the most important thing there. I would agree. And sometimes, although that's not a pleasant place or easy place to be in as the fundraiser, it can definitely open up a narrative with other other groups, other companies that this is happening in this space in your organization, and it's opening up. It's an opportunity for you to seek new partnerships. Um, and again, if you've tracked the value that the partnerships are bringing to you, um, and you're able to say, one group is, is lessening funds, we're looking for a partner that can help us uh, expand beyond, uh, it could certainly help with that narrative wealth. But I would definitely agree. Understanding why helps you develop the strategy of where to go next. Interesting. Now we have a couple more coming in. Uh, we have one that says, any advice for organizations looking for funding for one project only for non-ongoing programs and initiatives? Uh, that sounds like um, maybe like a campaign of some sort or a special one thing you're trying to launch. Uh, I would say that a lot of what we talked about still holds true. I mean, there still needs to be alignment between what the company cares about and what you are doing with that special project. Um, it has to fit. To be honest, it might be an easier pitch to make if you tell them up, up, the, up, you know, up front that this is a one-time ask because once it gets launched, it's launched and you know it's off and running. You won't need funding for it anymore. It's self-sustaining or whatever the reason is that you wouldn't be asking for more. Um, if that's truly the case, then don't hide that because that 
makes it all the easier for some companies to work you into something um, that they know that they're not necessarily working you into something forever. Also, a lot of funders, foundations, and companies alike really love knowing that they helped launch something, that they helped you build something um, that, uh, you know, if there's only one time need, my presumption is it's because it's it's something new mm -hmm. and launching and, and a lot like knowing that they were part of, they were the catalyst for that. Um, I think we have time for about two more questions. This one is from Gary. He asks, is there a tool that they can use to gauge if a corporate partnership is on track to achieve the ultimate results? I would say it's really based on the program. Um, being very intentional to begin with, what, why, is that pro, why is that program, what is it that you're doing to measure the impact of that program already? Think about it in those terms. How are you sharing that impact be before the partnership even begins? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be 8, 12, 15 data points of success. It can be, here's our vision. Here is the, the benchmarks and the goals that we know if we're accomplishing and moving forward to that. And then being very intentional about how you're collecting that information. I don't think that there, I would, I would be remiss if I said that there was one thing that's the, that's the arrow to the center of the, the, the target there. It's more about each program is each program is so different in what it's striving to accomplish. I would definitely want to have if that's that's the, that's the kind of conversation to have with your partner, with your corporate partner as your what is what is what's important to them again, having those same goal conversations, and how is it that you're going to track that um, and report back to them. They have they also have to track their business goals, so they might actually have some good ideas as far as. How do you keep track of that and then how do you express that your your um, programs have met their goals that you've stated to begin with yeah i would just add that you both have goals so while your goal might be that the third grade class achieves a certain level of proficiency in math because you're doing some a remedial math program and you certainly want to report back to them that that's happened by whatever your testing methods are their other goal might have been that they wanted 25 employees to volunteer in that program that year and so you want to make sure you're tracking your goals and their goals and as far as the one tool i mean you could use something as simple as excel it's more a matter of remembering what it is you're trying to track and tracking along the way so you don't get to the end of the partnership and have someone ask you a question and realize that you never collected the data right um, if you're not going to use it then <laughs> or yeah. Get, yeah one more taryn well, th yep, we actually have one more, and this is from Jenny. She asks, do you have any suggestions for nurturing partnerships while a company is building an endowed fund and before the fund is creating a specific impact? I, I would say, you know, it sounds like you have a sense that you're going to get a gift from that company or that fund down the line, but it's not, they're just not prepared yet to release it. So they're, you know, keeping them in that cultivation stage and nurture, like you said, nurturing the relationship um, by inviting them to site visits, if that's an option that you have, um, inviting them to your events, if you have other kinds of events, um, and just continuing to build the relationship without pushing them towards mm -hmm. something. If they've expressed that that is something that'll be available in 2020, then you know, be careful not to be asking for anything outside of the information they gave you. Um, but you know, keep them in the loop of your work so that when the time comes that they're ready to distribute funds, you you are the first person they think of. They know you very well. They know how to reach you, and it's easy to pick up on the funding conversation because you've built a relationship along the way. Ladies, I want to say thank you again, Lori and Tracy, for joining us um, today. I just want to tell everyone that participated that you will be receiving a recording of the class today. Um, if you have any other follow-up questions, we'll be sure to send that out in our follow-up email. If you have any interest in Thread Strategies, we'll be sure to send out any contact information or social medias. And once again, Lori, Tracy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us, and we look forward to following up with everyone with their questions later. Thank you. Thank you.